Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be doing another history and makeup video or makeup and history or whatever. I'm not even totally sure what to call this series. Today we are going to be discussing the tragic story of the lovely American icon Marilyn Monroe. Now uh, her story is pretty tragic and just riddled with trouble. I mean, she's one of the most iconic figures in the history of cinema. Let's discuss her, I love her. <laughs> Today's look is gonna be way more interesting than the last one I did, I promise. <laughs> so I hope you guys enjoy. Marilyn Monroe was born Norma Jean Mortensen on June 1st, 1926. She usually used Baker as her last name, which is the name of her mother's first husband. Her mother, Gladys Baker, worked as a film negative cutter at a movie studio for some time. Now before Marilyn was born, her mother Gladys had two children by her first husband. She married him as a teenager and their names are Robert and Bernice and as far as I can tell, I think Bernice is still alive. I've seen some pictures of her online and I'm pretty sure she just turned 101. Marilyn never knew who her father was, although she did try to contact a man that she believed was him, or he, would, he wouldn't really have anything to do with her. Grace Goddard was a friend of Marilyn's mother, Gladys, and she ended up taking responsibility over Marilyn and Gladys's affairs once Gladys got moved into a hospital due to mental health issues. And Marilyn lived with her for a good stretch of time. She was in and out of different homes and like orphanages and stuff for a period, so she never really had any good form of stability except for Grace. Grace's husband, Doc, I think his name is, he had a job offer and they were going to move to West Virginia. They couldn't take Marilyn with them because it was illegal to take minors across state lines, I believe was the case. So instead of her having to go back to the orphanage they devised a plan with her first boyfriend she ended up getting married to james daugherty i think is how you pronounce his name she got married to him so that way she wouldn't have to go back to the orphanage and she ended up dropping out of school and becoming a housewife that looks good doesn't have to be special it's not what we're going for we're not going for perfect technique because sweetheart this is not going to be a look that you can really wear out anywhere I mean, if you're feeling adventurous, then maybe, but you know, I probably wouldn't do it. I mean, I, well, no, I, I actually did. I, I lied, I take that back. I, I probably would. <laughs> just because I love wearing crazy looking makeup out in public, but that's just me. <laughs> she was discovered by working at the radio playing company by a man named David Conover. He was going around taking pictures to boost morale amongst the military folk by showing, you know, hey, all the ladies are working at home doing their part and he found her and was just like would you mind modeling for me and she was like well yes thank you oh my god this is crazy do you like me and he was like oh yes it was during this period that she began to lighten her hair to become more marketable for modeling companies <clears throat> she ended up appearing in about i think somewhere around 30 magazine covers by 1947, so she was already starting to get more attention. Not long after this, she had her first screen test, but it didn't really impress the head executive, Daryl Zanuck, so despite her getting a contract, she wasn't used, but she tried to use that time a little bit more wisely, and she spent time with people on the lot to try to get to know how the system works better. She would take like acting classes and dance classes and singing lessons and this is something that would continue throughout her career. You know, with the help of Ben Lyon, they picked out her future stage name, Marilyn Monroe. So even though with her first contract, she didn't get any jobs, she worked hard to improve her skill. In 1948, she signed with Columbia Pictures and she finally had her hair dyed all the way to platinum and she had her hairline raised but it's, there's speculation that she had multiple cosmetic procedures done throughout her career because I mean you can tell quite obviously that, that she doesn't look the same that she did whenever she was known as Norma Jean. Why did I do that? That was her friggin name. Johnny Hyde was a talent agent 
from the William Morris Agency and he took Marilyn under his wing after her role in Ladies of the Chorus and later on they ended up developing a sexual relationship. He ended up asking her to marry him. One of my favorite portrayals of this happening is in the life of Marilyn Monroe. I think it's a Lifetime movie. I mean, I know that they aren't usually known for having like wonderful movies, but he's like, I left my wife. And she's like, Wh why? I didn't ask you to. Not long after this, she began to receive more supporting roles and her fame began to grow and so did her praise from that she received from critics. Since she began to get more famous, a ghost from her past came back to haunt her. She had posed nude and partially nude for photos in 1949. She took them using the moniker Mona Monroe and they were supposed to be published in a calendar where she even asked whenever she was doing it, is anybody going to recognize me? And they're like, no, it's just going to be in like some gas station calendar. But speculation began to grow that this was indeed Marilyn. And instead of running away from the problem, she made sure to face it head on and stress that she really needed the money at the time. She began seeing Joe DiMaggio in 1952, and they ended up getting married in 1954. Her reputation slowly began to worsen during this time. She developed a reputation of being difficult to work with. What they mean by being difficult to work with is that uh, Marilyn became more dependent on direction from her acting coach, Natasha Lytes. It, but this would really start to irk her directors. She developed a perfectionist style personality. She was also becoming more and more anxious and to deal with that anxiety and low self-esteem that she was really feeling, she began to become more dependent on barbiturates and alcohol. In 1953 was the year that Marilyn had truly arrived on the Hollywood scene. She had three films come out. The first film that she starred in in 1953 was Niagara. The movie was popular amongst the audiences but some critics felt that it was too dark and cliche. The New York Times said that it basically solidified Marilyn as a sex symbol. And they said, and I quote, The falls in Miss Monroe are something to see. She can be seductive, even when she walks. Her next film was with Jane Russell, and it was Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. This is the movie that the iconic Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend song comes from. There were some rumors that her and her co-star Jane Russell did not get along, but Jane, she was pretty quick to dispel those rumors in interviews. She really liked Marilyn. She said that Marilyn was one of the hardest working people that she knew. But instead of doing like Jane and going home and trying to relax, she decided to stay and work and train so that way she could improve her craft. For the film's pre-release press, they had the two women do their handprints at Grauman's Chinese Theater. Her last film of 1953 was How to Marry a Millionaire. An interesting fact about How to Marry a Millionaire, along with, I guess, partially gentlemen prefer blonde, is that her role in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes was originally supposed to go to her co-star in How to Marry a Millionaire, Betty Grable. And How to Marry a Millionaire became Marilyn's biggest box office hit yet. It was also the second film filmed in Cinemascope. And remember how I talked about those nude photos? In 1953, that was the year that she was featured on the very first cover of Playboy magazine. And with that came the origin of Mr. Hugh Hefner. But the photo that was used for the cover, Marilyn did not authorize. She did not give any permission for them to use it, but it was from a parade from the Miss America pageant. Wow, those aren't even at all. Note to self, don't talk while doing wing liner. But despite being one of her studio's biggest stars, her contract remained the same as it was since 1950. She was getting paid like pretty far less than everybody else and she felt that that was pretty unfair. She she wasn't allowed to have really any creative freedom whenever it came to picking her roles. She was just kind of cast. 
so Zanuck, the head of Fox, he just refused to let her branch out and try any different roles. But since he would refuse to let her expand her horizons, she refused to do one of their movies called The Girl in the Pink Tights. And because of this, she was suspended. To counteract the negative press, Marilyn and Joe DiMaggio got married and they traveled to Japan on their honeymoon. And not long after that, Marilyn flew to Korea to perform a USO sh show for the troops. After returning to the US, her and Fox were able to reach an agreement and she settled for a new contract and a $100,000 bonus. Once her and Fox were able to reach the agreement, she began filming The Seven Year Itch, which in my opinion is Marilyn's most iconic role because you have the dress and then the subway and then the dress going floof and it's just a fun time. Or at least it was for the 2,000 bystanders that were there for that shoot. Multiple takes were done. I'm pretty sure we can all figure out why. But Joe DiMaggio felt that Marilyn had disgraced him whenever they were shooting that scene because she was basically put on display in front of tons of people and he was just absolutely disgusted by this. He started to become more controlling and abusive. When she came back from Hollywood after filming concluded for The Seven Year Itch, she ended up filing for divorce. Now with the help of Milton Green, he was a photographer, they formed Marilyn Monroe Productions. This has been described as one of the instrumental things that led to the studio system falling. She stated that she was not under contract by Fox because they did not pay her the money that she was owed. They hadn't held up their end of the bargain, so she's not going to hold up hers. She was parodied by Jane Mansfield. She was deemed as like the newest blonde bombshell at the time. Jane Mansfield was playing a famous movie star who decided to form her own production company in Will Success Spoil Rock Hunter. She began taking lessons from Lee Strasberg, who ran the actor's studio. She started undergoing psychoanalysis at this time as well. Now, not long after she started undergoing the psychoanalysis, she began seeing Arthur Miller, who would become her future second husband. He had ties to communism and he was being investigated by the FBI. So this is where the FBI really starts to get information on her because they were suspicious of her. She and Fox were able to reach a new agreement. She was to be paid $400,000 for four films and she was granted more creative freedom. Monroe and Miller were married on June 29th, 1956. It was described by the papers as egghead weds hourglass because they, they just seemed so mismatched. There you guys, I am absolutely awful at applying lip products. So try not to judge me too bad. But during the filming of her first independent project, The Prince and the Showgirl, her and her co-star, Laurence Olivier, there was a lot of tension between them. He basically like really made her mad by saying all you have to do is look pretty. And this infuriated her. She basically reacted to this by becoming more difficult to work with and arriving late on purpose. And after the difficulties of filming this film, her personal life began to worsen. Her addiction began to worsen. She ended up having an overdose and being hospitalized and she ended up having a ectopic pregnancy and then she ended up having a miscarriage. In 1958, Marilyn returned to Hollywood and began filming Some Like It Hot. And this is personally my favorite Marilyn movie. It is so good. I highly recommend you guys watch it if you can find it anywhere, but it is, it's such a funny movie. But she originally didn't like the role of Sugar King. She felt that it was just another stereotypical dumb blonde role, but she was encouraged by her husband to take the role. She also got 10% of the film's profits on top of her regular pay. Now the difficult time that they had filming this movie is legendary, as they say. Tony Curtis family famously stated that kissing her was like kissing Hitler due to the number of retakes. Her and the director had a bunch of disagreements on the role. She asked to have some of her scenes altered and this just made him totally furious. In turn, her stage fright got worse and the whole thing just became like a sinking ship. At the end of the day, Wilder 
The director was very happy with her performance and the movie became a success. Am I sexy yet? It has been voted as one of the best films ever made. Diamonds are a girl's best friend, y'all. By the time she started in 1959's Let's Make Love, people were already starting to say that she was starting to lack the old Monroe dynamism. Her last completed film was The Misfits, written by her husband at the time, Arthur Miller. Miller wrote that film for her so she could have a more dramatic role like she had been really wanting. But during this time, it was pretty much clear that Marilyn and Arthur were not going to go the distance. They had many disagreements and their relationship just fell apart pretty quickly. She didn't really like the fact that he had basically written the role about her personal life and this caused a lot of contention. After filming wrapped on The Misfits and it was released, it was basically like a bomb and Marilyn and Arthur decided to separate after this and she went ahead and got what they call it's like a Mexican divorce. Even though it was kind of a bomb whenever it was originally released, as time went on, her performance began to get more and more praise, and time has been a little bit more lenient with her. Now, in 1961, she was plagued by more personal and health problems. She ended up having a gallbladder surgery and a surgery to help her endometriosis, and she was kind of in and out of the hospital for a while. In early 1962, Marilyn began to film Something's Got to Give, which also starred Dean Martin. Her drug use just started to escalate. She started to get sick more frequently, so her performance was just not there, and she ended up taking like six weeks off so she could focus on her health. But she did take a break to sing Happy Birthday, Mr. President, to President John F. Kennedy. And she wore the iconic skin-tight beige dress, and a lot of people thought that that was so scandalous because she basically had to be sewn into the dress, and the dress made her look naked. Because she wasn't able to perform very well due to all of those personal health issues, something's got to give just kind of went into production hell. They just weren't able to handle it running over budget anymore or prolonging the shoot, so they decided to fire her. But Dean Martin, he refused to do the film with anybody but Marilyn. So Fox ended up like suing him and then they shut down the production. So even after this disagreement with Fox and they fired her, they regretted their decision not long after and they had planned on her starring in What A Way To Go. She was also wanting to star in a biopic for Jean Harlow. Despite all of these planned projects for the future, no one expected what happened on the night of August 4th to the 5th, 1962. Marilyn went to bed somewhere between 8.30 and 10.30 and she just didn't wake up. Her housekeeper, Mrs. Murray, woke up at about 3 a.m. feeling that something was off and that she, she should go check on her. She saw that the light under her door was on, which was unusual. She knocked on the door, but she, she didn't get an answer. But the weird thing is, is that instead of calling like 911 or something, they called Marilyn's psychiatrist, Ralph Greenson, and had him come over and he broke into the room. And it was he who found Marilyn dead. Now, Marilyn's death is totally drowned in conspiracy theories. And I mean, I think that there's some interesting evidence for some of those. If you guys would like me to go into some of the conspiracy theories in a different video, I can do that. Um, I won't do that immediately after this one because I would like to just kind of jump around a little bit, but I do want to go into maybe do like a big video about different conspiracies throughout history. It's been pretty much confirmed that an accidental overdose has been ruled out because there was no way that she could get all of that medication in her system. It was many, many times over the lethal limit. And, you know, I've, I've heard some people say that there was just no way that you could take all of those pills to equal the amount that she supposedly took without vomiting it up. So I don't, I don't fully know where I stand on a lot of the conspiracy theories, but a lot of things are pretty suspicious there. I want to save her relationship with the Kennedys for, you know, a whole different video. I feel like, you know, just going over Marilyn's history, it, it isn't really like of huge importance whenever you try to like look at the bigger picture involving her life. It is so tragic though, because Marilyn, she was only 36 whenever she died. It's just, it's so short. And I mean, life is short in general, but to only live to be 36, 
it's so sad and she was so troubled it, it's frustrating but my camera's about to die so i hope you guys liked it and i will cover the conspiracies in a different video coming up if you like this video make sure to leave a like and consider subscribing and i will see you again next week bye